Well, good evening. It is great to see your smiling faces here tonight. Uh, hopefully you picked up, did everyone pick up uh, uh, the handout that was out on the table? You should have a handout, it's stapled together. Good many pages in there uh, for you to, to follow along with um, as uh, we have the opportunity to do that. Yes? Oh, if, you, if anyone needs one, we have some that we can pass out. So uh, Mark needs one. <laughs> It is great to have with us uh, here this weekend, Mark Farnham. Uh, Dr. Farnham is a uh, former pastor. He pastored for seven years in New London, Connecticut. And then the Lord led him to Calvary Baptist Seminary in Lansdale, Pennsylvania. Uh, and he was there uh, as a professor. And then the Lord led him over to Lancaster Bible College where he's uh, currently ministering there as a professor uh, working in their uh, uh, school there with the priest seminary. He's heading that uh, department up. So he's very busy and uh, he has uh, been blessed to uh, develop uh, this um, seminar material on apologetics. And I happened to uh, see his display when uh, some of our, our pastors were down at the um, Shepherd's uh, Seminary in Cary, North Carolina. We were down there for their pastor's conference and they had several of these displays set up and I saw his uh, display, picked his card up and uh, one thing led to another. That was probably three years ago, um, but it takes time, these things, you know, uh, and just really happy to be able to have him here. We've been primed a little bit because our ABFs have been uh, in the past uh, working on uh, the subject of apologetics and hopefully you have an interest in this area that's been peaked and maybe you have some questions. I know Mark will be taking questions later, uh, but it'll give us an opportunity to be able to, to go through some subjects subject matter that's very, very appropriate for us today. And I, I have shared over and over again the need for us to be able to give a defense in these areas because the world has a pretty solid, uh, in their mind, argument that they're presenting us with. And our young people today are hearing this argument as if it's absolutely 100% true. And uh, we want to show them what real truth is. And so uh, I'm excited to, to have uh, Brother Farnham here with us here this weekend. So tonight we will have uh, two sessions. We'll have a break uh, after session one. You'll be able to stretch your legs and walk around a little bit, use restrooms. And then uh, we'll come back in for our second session. And then tomorrow I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But uh, we'll have three sessions tomorrow in the morning. So we're looking forward to it. Let's start with a word of prayer and I'll turn it over to Mark here this evening. Father, as we come before you tonight, we're so very thankful, Lord, that you have given to us a revelation of yourself in your word. And we're so thankful, Lord, that we can understand who you are and understand, Lord, that uh, you are truly uh, God over us. And we thank you uh, for that reality. Help us, Father, as we listen to the things that are spoken, uh, to have a knowledge and an understanding uh, that will lead us, Father, to uh, a place where we can easily defend arguments that come from the world uh, that would reduce uh, our great God to something far less. Help us, Lord, with this, and help us, Lord, as we listen to be able to process all of this information, and help us, Lord, to be able to take it from here into the marketplace. Be with Brother Mark, Lord, as he uh, opens the word and as he teaches us tonight. May we be blessed, may he be strengthened, and may you be glorified. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark. Well, it is a great honor to be with you uh, this weekend. I'm looking forward to the opportunity to interact, answer questions, present material. The first time I met Kevin, I think I was probably 13 years old, and I met him on a beach in Cape Cod. Uh, my younger sister became friends with his younger sister because we used to vacation there, and um, I remember he came and picked her up one time at the beach, and he was, I don't know, I think you're like 10 years older than me, so he was early 20s, and uh, just saw him for a moment, and then years later found out we went to the same seminary together. And uh, actually, when I was a pastor in New London, Connecticut, my home state, uh, after seven years, I left there to go teach seminary. And uh, Kevin was pastoring in Pennsylvania, and I told the deacons in my church, please contact this guy. He's, he's a New Englander. He probably wants to come back. And they waited too long. 
and Kevin went to Boston instead of to the church that I left, but uh, it's, it's good to reconnect and see him again. Uh, what we're going to do this weekend is bring apologetics down to the practical level. How do you, as a, the average Christian, who's not a um, pastor, not a professor, how do you engage unbelievers effectively, regardless of who they are? And uh, this is something that for years I had questions about, and then when I began to study it, I felt like so many questions were answered and encouraged me that we need to learn more about this uh, as a church in the United States. Uh, there's a couple of things about this weekend. The, the handouts are meant to be a resource to you, so hopefully that will be helpful. And there are books out in the back lobby. Um, just full disclosure, you can buy those books for the same price at Amazon. So I can buy them at discount, but by the time I sell them back to you, it's Amazon prices. But if you're like me and you like to walk away with something in your hand, then that's what they're there for. So please help your, don't help yourself. Please buy them if they're useful to you. <laughs> and we take uh, cash or a credit card. But you, some of them you could probably even get cheaper online. But uh, hopefully that will be a resource to you. I want to say a few things about my, my family. Um, here's a picture of my family. You don't have a confidence monitor, do you? Okay, I just want to make sure I have to turn around. So that's, we had a picture taken a few years ago, and um, there's me in the background next to my newest son-in-law who's taller than me. Uh, so that, that always surprised me. And in front of him is my younger daughter, Kelsey. On the far left is my son, Ryan, my only son, and uh, he's a senior at Lancaster Bible College where I teach, majoring in pastoral studies, uh, hoping to go to seminary or end up in New England somewhere as a pastor. Uh, in front of me to my right, or on the left-hand side, is my mother-in-law, and then next to her is my wife. And then on the far right is my older daughter and uh, my son-in-law, who's a pastor up in Pennsylvania, and my grandson, who's now almost two years old. Oh, man. I never understood grandparents until I became one. And then instantly, it's like, I get it. Show the pictures, talk about them all the time. So he's almost two years old, and... Uh, just had a chance to see him a couple weeks ago, so we're thankful for that. So let's jump right in and talk about how do we become confident as believers. If you want to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, we have the primary text in the New Testament that lays out direction for how to engage unbelievers effectively. I was not born into a Christian home. My dad grew up in an orphanage, uh, met my mom, who was an Irish Catholic girl from the south end of Hartford, Connecticut. They got married. It was disaster from the very beginning. And uh, it wasn't long before my mom was on a spiritual search looking for answers. And as a little kid, we went from church to church trying to find answers. And finally, one day, she met a Polish Catholic lady who had just come to Christ and understood my mother's uh, you know, background religiously and shared the gospel with her. My mom became a Christian when I was about seven years old. And she started bringing us to church, and two years later at the age of nine, in vacation Bible school, I became a Christian and was baptized in the creek behind the church out in the woods of western Connecticut. And from a very early age, saw the total life transformation in my mom when she became a Christian. Uh, instead of having parties at her house, instead of her being kind of a 70s flower child, from what I remember, she became a Bible studier, and she'd have books out and have her Bible. She'd be marking it up, studying it. Had such an impact on me that I decided I wanted to be a pastor at 12 years old. So I was one of those weird kids that knew he wanted to be a pastor at 12 years old. And so went to, went through high school, went off to Bible college, and uh, studied to be a pastor, graduated, and got married shortly thereafter, and then went to seminary. And be, uh, a few years later, became a pastor in my home state of Connecticut in a city called New London, which is a, where there's a nuclear submarine base. So I know this is a big, is this a big Navy area I heard? I know. Annapolis is the Navy area. I know. We had three or four men in my church who were junior officers on subs who were Annapolis uh, Naval Academy grads. And um, started preaching, but all through my life struggled to understand how to evangelize. I was part of my church's SWAT team when I was in junior high. No, we were not extremists. It was soul-winning active teens. 
And every Wednesday night, we'd go out on the streets of West Hartford, Connecticut, which is a very wealthy city, and we would pass out gospel tracts. And our goal was always to get someone to take a track uh, without asking us questions, because we were not taught to engage people with the gospel. Or if we were, we would give the gospel burp. Have you ever heard of the gospel burp? It's where you say to someone, excuse me, sir, do you know for sure if you die, take it, do you go to heaven? Can I tell you that Jesus loves you, but you've fallen into sin, and therefore you're on your way to hell, but God loves you, and he gave Jesus to die on the cross. If you just believe in him right now, pray and ask him to save you, then you can be saved. And we call it the gospel burp because I felt better and the other person was offended, all right? <laughs> And we were, we were taught to monologue the gospel, get it out there as quickly as you can before they cut you off. And soul winning wasn't quite that effective. I mean, God bless, and there were people saved from time to time. But I went off to Bible college, later to seminary, became a pastor, and I still didn't feel confident that I could engage people with the gospel. And it wasn't until years later when I began to do doctoral work in apologetics, literally within the first month or two of my program, all my questions that I'd always had about this were answered. And I thought, this has to be told. People need to learn this kind of stuff because it was instantly effective in my life. And uh, within the first couple of months of taking my doctoral classes, um, I realized that I'd gotten in over my head, you know, reading like a thousand pages a week, writing digests of summaries of everything you're reading. So I was at a Starbucks in the Philadelphia area one day, and I had like three or four large books to read that week. I thought, how am I ever going to get this done? And so I'm studying. I'm loving every minute of it, learning how to engage people with the gospel, studying Christian apologetics. And, and this woman comes and sits down next to me, and uh, we were sitting rather close together as you, you, the chairs are typically set near each other in Starbucks. And um, she sat down next to me and she went, <sighs> and I came to realize she wants to talk to me. And I'm sitting there looking at my pile of books saying, I don't have time to talk to this woman. I'm learning how to engage unbelievers with the gospel. <laughs> yeah. And I argued with the Holy Spirit for like 10 minutes saying, Lord, I don't have time for this. And the Holy Spirit kept saying, close the books. I've given you a great opportunity to put into practice what you've already begun to learn. So reluctantly, I closed my book and I turned to her and I said, sound like you're having a bad day oh, yeah, I had this procedure done. The insurance company won't cover it, and it's so frustrating. And I just said, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. I, I'll pray for you. And her head shot around, and she said to me, what, are you some kind of religious nut? I said, no, I'm a Christian. I believe God answers prayer. And then I did what we'll begin to learn about tonight and primarily tomorrow morning. I just began to ask strategic questions. I began to say things like, well, what's your religious background? And she said, well, I'm an atheist. I said, oh, okay, you don't believe God exists? That's right. And then she paused and she kind of said, well, I don't know if God exists. I said, oh, you're an agnostic. She goes, yes, that's what I am. And then she goes, well, I don't know. I kind of think God is everywhere and in everything. I said, oh, you're a pantheist. She goes, yes, that's what I am. We began talking, and I just began to ask questions to find out what she believed and why she believed it. And a few minutes into the conversation, a guy came and sat down next to her and joined in. And after a little while, I said, are, are you guys together? And they looked at each other, and he said, no. He said, I just heard what you're talking about. It sounded really interesting. I wanted to come by and join. And the conversation went on for two hours. It had already been going on for 15 minutes, so almost two and a half hours, this conversation went on. And inside, I'm like, it works. What I'm learning, it works. It was so exciting. The first time in my life in trying to evangelize and share the gospel, I felt like I know what I'm doing, and it's powerful. And by the end of the two and a half hours, this guy stood up. He goes, man, I got to go. I didn't mean to stay. I've got things to do. But he said, I don't even know what I believe anymore. Everything that I believe when I walked in here, you took away from me. I was able to share the gospel and encourage them to go home and read the gospel accounts of Jesus. Um, and uh, never heard from either one of them again, gave them my business cards. It happened so often. But came to realize that I, I just planted seeds in their life. And we're going to talk about that metaphor through the weekend. Is that every opportunity that you and I have 
to engage unbelievers, whether it lasts two minutes or two hours, is a seed planted in their life of the truth that God can then use, sometimes that week, sometimes 10 years later, to begin to draw them to Christ. And if we would see our engagement with unbelievers that way, and some of the other truths that we'll encounter, we come to realize, I don't have to be terrified to engage people because my job is just to plant seeds. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God who gave the increase. So he that plants is nothing, and he who waters is nothing, but God who gives the increase, God who harvests. And it began to make me realize I can rather, because the way I was taught to evangelize, if you did not lead people to a saving knowledge of Christ, praying a prayer, the first time you taught them, it was a failure. You had to go back for more training to learn to be more persuasive, grip their hand harder, put your hand on their shoulder, make sure you have a breath mint in your, in your mouth. I mean, all these tactics and strategies that were all external, and if they didn't trust Christ then and there, it was a failure. This new model of reaching people helped me realize it's God who's going to save this person. I have a part to play. It may be in harvesting. I might start to witness to someone. They say, oh, people have been telling me this for years. I know I need this. Can you help me to become a Christian? Can you help me to trust? And you're going to think, this evangelism thing is so easy. What are people talking about? And the, the reality is you're harvesting what other people have planted. Or you might be the very first person to ever clarify the gospel for someone. Uh, I was just in Louisville, Kentucky last week and for a conference and I was with my son and son-in-law and we were taking the shuttle back to the church and of course, everyone down south thinks that they're a Christian. So I started engaging the shuttle driver uh, with the gospel, and I said, has anyone ever shared, has anyone explained it to, to you this way after I'd shared the gospel? He said, no, I don't think they have. So you could be the very first person, and sometimes we get discouraged if they don't respond in faith right away, but we have to realize this is God's work. I have a part to play, and therefore there's no pressure on me. If I blow it, it's not going to ruin their chance for salvation. Because God is greater than my failure. And that takes all the pressure off you. And we're going to learn throughout the weekend several ways in which understanding evangelism correctly takes the pressure off you. And it's not as, you know, pulse racing, white knuckled, terrifying as we tend to think it is. So let's jump in. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3 then. Peter is writing to Christians who are under persecution from the Roman Empire. And Peter says, beginning in verse 13, 1 Peter 3, 13, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Well, actually a lot of people, but ultimately no one. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. So let's notice, first of all, that let's look, let's look at an introduction to apologetics. What is it? Apologetics is, first of all, a... Um, sorry about that. I... I gave your guy in the back the wrong PowerPoint. So I'm going to just have to do this from memory so you can ignore some of the pictures here. Let me give you some of the definitions. Apologetics means to give an answer, literally. And some translations will say make a defense or give an answer. So the first blank there is to give an answer. It's to clear oneself of charges. It's a legal term to clear yourself of charges or to defend oneself in a court of law. So let's say your pastor is accused of robbing banks in the you know, greater Baltimore area. He's going to hope when he goes to trial that his defense attorney is going to say something more than it, it couldn't be him, he's a nice guy. That's not a good defense, is it? He's going to hope that his defense attorney is going to come up with, here's the reasons why it couldn't be, because he was, he was in somewhere, he was in a different place when this bank was robbed, and there were eyewitness, eyewitness accounts, and there were no fingerprints of his anywhere around this, and 
he's going to hope that he's going to lay out all these good answers, all this evidence, all this defense, and that's what we're called to do. We are called to defend the truth of the gospel, the glory of God. And then that last little definition there is the art of persuasion. The art of persuasion. That is apologetics is about helping people who don't know Christ to see that their greatest need is Christ and to overcome their objections. Notice, secondly then, and I think this is where we pick up with the PowerPoint, apologetics is a natural part of evangelism in which objections to the Christian gospel are overcome by means of reason and persuasion. That's a natural part of evangelism. In other words, I don't think you can do evangelism without knowing some apologetics. Because as soon as someone raises an objection, well, how do you know the Bible is true? How can there be a good, loving God when there's so much evil and suffering in the world? How can there only be one way? There's so many religions. How do we even know Jesus existed? And on and on and on. There are literally hundreds of objections that people raise against the truth of the gospel. And Peter here tells us that we need to be prepared as we're sharing the gospel to give an answer as best that we can. And my favorite definition is the last one there. Apologetics is premeditated evangelism. Premeditated evangelism. In other words... It's thinking ahead of time what questions might people ask, and to the best of my ability, being able to anticipate those questions and provide an answer. And in the text there where it says, always being prepared to make a defense, that word defense is the Greek word apologetic. And it's not the only time it's used in the New Testament. A number of times Paul uses it, twice in Philippians 1, several times in the book of Acts, as he's about to explain why he is preaching about this resurrected Jew, Paul says, I'm making my defense, I'm preparing my defense, and that's the word apologetic. And so it's this legal term to give answers for why we believe what we believe. I don't know what I just did there. Did I do something, or did you? Ah, there we go. This is the right presentation. Thank you. I, I should have uh, given you more clear uh, directions on that. Okay, to defend yourself, court of law, art of persuasion. There we go. Apologetics is premeditated evangelism. So let's look, first of all, at number one. The starting point of apologetics, then, is a settled assurance that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life for every person. That is, if you yourself are having doubts, having questions, and by the way, let me encourage you, if that's the case, that's relatively normal. Because if we're engaging some of the thought of this world, we're going to have questions. If you listen to certain critics that are going to say, you know, we don't even know if Jesus existed, or the Bible's been disproven by science. If you hear that enough, you're going to start to say, man, I, are they right? Uh, you know, how do I answer that kind of thing? So we have to start ourselves with the settled assurance of what we believe, primarily centered on Jesus, is the way, the truth, and the life for every person. That means several things. First of all, um, as Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. In other words, I have to remind myself as I'm engaging unbelievers, I come with the authority of the risen Christ who will someday rule and reign on this earth and rules and reigns in heaven right now. Therefore, I'm not coming as my own messenger, but I'm coming as his. So what are some of the exclusive claims of Christianity that must be settled in my heart and mind? First of all, no other belief system reconciles a person to God. That is, I have to come to believe that Jesus is the truth, the only truth out there. And by the way, the, the way you come to conviction about that is not to take a few years and study world religion. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That would help you to understand what other people believe. But the primary way we come to believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life is through knowing Scripture. They're seeing what God's Word says. Now, I used to teach world religion for a few years at a secular university up in Pennsylvania. And it's beneficial to know a little bit about religion in the world. 
But you're never going to come to conviction about the truth of Christ by just studying other belief systems. We must study the truth. No other object of worship is real and true. That is, I have to come to believe, as the Bible says, that other gods, other deities of other religions, there's nothing actually there. There, God does not compete with other gods, as he tells us in Isaiah. He alone is the one true God. And then finally, that every person you meet needs the life that Jesus gives more than they need anything else in the world. And this is hard to remember sometimes. Have you ever met a happy pagan? Someone who has everything and is very happy, maybe even more joyful than the average Christian that you know. And they don't know Christ. They seem to be doing well. They have no problems. They're always giving inspirational quotes to you. Um, they seem to have nothing. But as we'll look at in the next session tonight, what God says about unbelievers and what's going on in their heart and minds, I've got to come to believe that this person, no matter how happy they seem to be on the outside, they are lost. They don't know what peace is. They don't know what hope is. They don't know what joy is. That they're in the same position as the person in Psalm 73. Remember the psalmist says, as for me, my foot had slipped. I'd almost gone down to the pit because when I looked around, the wicked were happy. They were healthy. And me, I feel like I'm dying. And then halfway through the psalm, he says, and then I entered the sanctuary of God. And I remembered what's going to happen to them in the end. And I used to think that meant he walked into church and praised the Lord and felt encouraged by good singing and good preaching. But the sanctuary in his day was either the tabernacle or the temple. And what did he see when he walked in there? Lambs with their throats being slit and the blood draining out as they shook as their life drained out of them, then being burned on the altar. In other words, he realized this is what will happen to those who reject Christ. Therefore, on the outside, they seem great, but in reality, they are headed toward destruction. So one of the best ways to become an effective apologist, an evangelist, is to know the scriptures and theology. I found a picture of this t-shirt a few years ago. I really like it. It says, theology is simply that part of religion that requires brains. C.S. Lewis used to say, it's not that Christianity has been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. See, too many times, even as Christians, we, we coast in our Christian life. We come to church, read our Bibles, we pray. But we're really not striving to learn more intentionally. We're not seeking, as the Bible talks about in the, in the book of Proverbs, seeking as treasure the wisdom of God. You know, treasure is not found on the surface. You've got to dig deep. You've got to mine that treasure. And sometimes we as Christians, we bemoan the condition of the world. We want to batten down the hatches and wait for Jesus to return. But he told us to go out and be light and salt, right? which means that we cannot stop learning and growing. We've got to learn to engage the world effectively. Notice, secondly, confidence comes from preparation. Back in the text here, Peter says, in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. I love to camp, uh, but when I grew up camping, my dad was a very disorganized person, so when he would say, let's go camping or let's go fishing, the way we began that was we began to go on a hunt then around our property for all of our equipment. There were the fishing rods left out from last summer, rusted over. There was the tent that had not been unpacked and swept and dried out that was now caked with mud and kind of permanently in a ball. Uh, the sleeping bags were nowhere to be found. And, and it actually took us two or three days to get ready to camp, and sometimes we ran out of time for camping. So when I... When I began to have a family of my own. I thought, I want to I camp with them. And I looked around at people who camped well. And you know what they do? They pack everything in these bins. And when they come home from camping, they'll spend a day or two cleaning their tent, repacking everything, cleaning everything out. And they stock everything in these bins. And when they want to go camping, they just pull things off the shelf, hop in the car and go. I thought, that's what I want. And that's what this verse is saying is, you and I as Christians, if we're going to engage unbelievers in the world... We need to be in constant preparation. We need to be reading. We need to be studying. We need to be engaging people. So when someone says, how do you know the Bible's reliable? We're working toward to having an answer for that. 
Or how do you know that God exists? We're, we're working on answers for that. Because if we're preparing ourselves, number one, that's going to excite you to engage people, and that's going to end up being a cycle where when you engage people, they're going to ask questions you didn't prepare for, which is going to drive you back to preparation. And eventually your preparation is going to catch up with your evangelism, and you're going to start to engage people and have answers, and they're going to say, you know, no one's ever been able to answer my questions before. And I've been searching for years. Tell me more. And let me tell you, there's nothing more exciting than that. I was doing a conference up in northern Pennsylvania back in January, and I was staying at a bed and breakfast. And it was at the second conference at that church in one year. They're like uber apologetics church, way out in the middle of nowhere. And so I stayed for the second time in this bed and breakfast run by a guy, uh, a single guy whose wife left him a few years ago. And um, it was just me. And so whenever I go up there, we sit for hours and talk. And here's a guy with all kinds of difficulty in his life and, and brokenheartedness. And he just hungers to talk to someone. But see... I think there's lots of people around us like that too. If we can engage people, begin to build relationships with them, we would find perhaps beyond their crusty exterior that they're really searching, that they're really hungering for answers or they're really desperate to know things. But we're intimidated and part of that is because we're not prepared. So being ready to give a defense means, first of all, we need to invest time, effort, sometimes money to learn answers. That is, now this is a radical idea, so hold on to your seats here. I think every Christian home ought to be having a growing library in their home of not only good theology books and Bible studies, but apologetics books. Radical idea, isn't it? I know, it's crazy. What am I thinking about? But folks, we live in an era of absolute gold mine of resources about apologetics. Uh, I kind of keep tab on a lot of apologetics being, books being written. I've counted in the last 20 years over 200 good books on apologetics that have been written. 200! I'm not saying go out and buy them all tonight. I mean, you could do that on Amazon. It's pretty easy, right? But just start with one. Maybe make the commitment to say, since I want to fulfill the great commission in my life to reach the lost people that I know, my neighbors that have no other Christian influence, my coworkers, my family members... I'm going to buy one book on reaching them this year, and I'll mention one of the best books out there. I have lots of copies of it. I'm going to read it, and I'm going to try to put into practice what it's saying. And next year, radical idea, I'll buy a second book. And I'll begin to build and learn. And let me tell you, when you begin to engage unbelievers, it becomes the closest thing to a spiritual addiction that you'll ever experience. Because there's incredible joy in talking to someone about their soul. Even if they respond poorly, even if they're hostile, there's something about that that makes you realize this person is reacting negatively for a reason. Because I'm touching a nerve. It's the people who are like, ah, oh, fine, whatever you want, that's great for you. Those are the hard ones to reach. But the people who get angry, who get antagonistic... You're touching a nerve of something in their life that they know is not right, and they don't want to hear it. And God can use you sometimes, not to, not to harass them, but to be a witness. When I was a pastor in Connecticut, we had a lot of temporary uh, workers that worked at the nuclear power plant, the submarine base, Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. So we had all kinds of people that came in for like a year and a half to three years, and they, their job would move them on again. And one guy who began to come to our church was a guy named Don Tall. And I thought, that should be my name, Don Tall. Yeah. <laughs> and I asked him one time, I said, how did you become a Christian? He goes, oh, he said, I was an antagonistic unbeliever. He said, I'm an engineer. I used to work in a room full of engineers. And he said, we were all profane people. But he said, my desk was near the vending machine. And there was a Christian guy that came in and serviced it. And he always tried to witness to me. And I would mock him. We would play pranks on him. We would make his life difficult. He said, this went on for more than a year. And he said, one day something happened in my life, some significant loss. And he said, the first person I thought of was the guy who services the vending machines. He said, the next time he came and I was waiting for him, and I said, I've got to talk to you. See, part of our problem is, is we don't have the confidence that the gospel can do that kind of thing. Uh, like Paul talks about in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. 
Sometimes when you live and work in a hostile environment and you've tried after a while, it's like, you know, my confidence in the gospel starts to decline. And that's understandable because we live in hostile situations. I would imagine this greater Baltimore, D.C. area, you got a lot of very contented pagans, very much like what life up in Connecticut and Massachusetts is. And that can beat you down. It can make you lose confidence. But if we learn to prepare ourselves, I think we can begin to see that we break through the crust of this outer defense against the Christian faith, which we'll talk about tomorrow morning, and people don't have answers. I'm thoroughly convinced of that. And we need to have a preparedness, a mindset of preparedness to speak the truth. That is, we have to be ready. We have to think. We walk out the door. Who might God bring across me every day? If you're a law enforcement officer or you're in the military, you know you don't go into duty without thinking, okay, I need to prepare myself, get my mind ready. And if we would have that attitude too in regard to the unbelievers we encounter, we'd be more ready. And then thirdly, we need to have good reasons for why we believe what we believe. In this passage, Peter says, always being prepared to make a defense, give an apologetic to anyone who asks you for a reason. The word reason there is a Greek word, logos, from which we get logic. In other words, I need to have good arguments for here's why I believe Jesus lived and died and rose again. I need to have arguments for why I believe that God can be good and loving even in a world where there's so much sin and evil. We'll cover that this weekend. We have to remember this. God has given us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. I love this picture. Pretty sure it's photoshopped. <laughs> but we are. I mean, Jesus said, I send you out as lambs among wolves. We are at the mercy of the world when it comes to sharing the good news of Jesus. But we are, we are accompanied by the power of the risen Christ. Thirdly, we need to learn to treat the unbeliever with love and dignity. Notice what he says toward the end of verse 15. Yet, do this, give, give a defense, make a defense with gentleness and respect. Sadly, many Christians, in response to the antagonism toward our Christian faith today, have turned around with antagonism toward the world. And that will never win people. We have to be willing to do what Jesus talked about and turn the other cheek, be willing to be insulted, to be slandered. And to be slandered means to have false things said about you. Notice at the very end of this verse, verse 16, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, not if, but when unbelievers say things about you which are cruel, unflattering, untrue, when they say those things about you, this guy's a religious nut, she is uh, homophobic, he hates other religions, all these things which I hope will not be true of us. When you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. In other words, my life is lived in such a way and my engagement with people is done in such a way that they know it's a lie. I think about something that happened recently in... Uh, in our town in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. One of our professors at the college, the uh, performing arts professor, runs a performing arts center downtown that's part of our Bible college, which many people find unique that a Bible college has this performing arts center right downtown in the midst of all these other universities and colleges, art centers. And he recently ran for public office. And he's a strong Christian. And um, someone in the news media um, Part of the LGBT community wrote this blasting editorial against him for being homophobic, for uh, saying that he hates gay people and transgender people. But this guy has worked so hard to be a good Christian testimony in the arts community that there was a barrage of editorials written by gay, lesbian, transgender people defending him in public, saying, listen, we don't agree with his position on this either. But what you said about him is not true. This guy is loving. This guy is kind. This guy cares about us. And they defended this Christian man who, who never changes position on any uh, sin or social issue because of the way he deals with people. And I think sometimes as Christians, we get defensive and can even become hostile in our engagement with the world. And that 
that kind of neg negates our testimony. So we need to learn to do, as this text says, is treat people with love and dignity. So what does that mean? It means we don't start arrogant confrontations. I know some people do apologetics as, let me get into a crowd of people and start shouting at them. That's not Christian. Uh, downtown in Lancaster, in the center of our little city, Christians go quite often to evangelize, which is a good thing, but sometimes they go with signs. They don't do turn or burn. It's not that bad, but things like repent and be saved. And, and one time there was a lady standing on a, on a high bench right downtown, kind of shouting out to people as they walked by. And so I went up to her. I said, uh, can I talk to you for a minute? She goes, no, I'm sorry, I'm busy. I'm like, what, what if I was responding to your sign? You would tell me, I said, really, can I just get a minute of your time? And she stepped down. I said, I'm a, I'm a Christian too. I'm, I'm curious, why are you doing evangelism this way? Why don't you come down and talk to people? on the street, and I praise God for the students at our college. Every week they go out to the downtown, they just walk through the downtown area and, and engage people with, with the gospel. And she said, I, I don't know, this is just what our church does. And she said, really, I, I don't have time to talk, I gotta get back and give the message. I thought, how sad that she's trying to lead people to Christ, share the truth of the gospel with them, but she doesn't actually wanna have a conversation with them. And how many people, especially today, are gonna respond to that? as opposed to sitting down next to someone on a bench and just engaging them in conversation. So we don't want to start arrogant confrontations. Our goal is not to win an argument. I had a student one time when I was talking about dealing with an antagonistic unbeliever, say, Dr. Farnham, how do you not just punch that guy right in the face? I said, well, that's not our evangelistic method, you know. <laughs> Doesn't matter how antagonistic they are, we, don't, we never respond that way. Thirdly, our goal is not to show our knowledge. Sometimes people think, oh, it must be so nice that, you know, you've got a doctorate and you can, I, I never mention that. It is an instant conversation killer. If I mention, you know, sometimes people say, what do you do? I say, I'm a college professor. And then I say, oh, where do you teach? I'm like, oh, don't ask. Not because I'm ashamed to teach at a Bible college, but because when I say that, they're like, oh, in their mind, they're thinking a walled compound with barbed wire and radical cultish teaching going on. So I, I never mention my education, my profession, unless I, unless I have to, because it's not about, am I smarter than you? In fact, I would rather play the part of someone, as I often do, to say, oh, that's interesting, you're a, you're a Mormon, or you're Muslim, or you're Sikh. Tell me about that. Even though I've taught world religion and know quite a bit about it, I always want to take the approach that, tell me, tell me about what you believe. Uh, last summer, I led a group of students to Oxford University in England for three weeks, and we studied British church history and English philosophy, and were able to engage all kinds of atheists and skeptics. And um, we flew up to Scotland overnight to, to see Scotland, and we stayed in a hostel, which is like a grown-up college dorm. You know, where you book a bed and it could be 10 other beds in there and you have no idea who's sleeping in there. It's, it's really risky. And uh, so we had girls with us. So I was able to book them a room. There was just enough beds for them so they didn't have to worry about a guy being in there with them. And we booked a room, my nephew and my son and I, and there was one empty bed. So we're praying, Lord, please don't let it be a girl. Not that I'm against girls. I just don't want a room with them overnight, as you can understand. Uh, and we thought, Lord, help this to be a good opportunity. And the guy who happened to be staying in our hostel room was a Sikh from India. Sikh is a kind of a small ethnic religion. They wear the turbans. After 9-11, a lot of Sikhs were attacked or criticized because people thought they were Muslim. But Sikhs have actually been fighting Muslims for centuries. And so he was a Sikh, and they have a very interesting religion. It's a warrior religion. And we just started asking questions. We talked for like an hour. He was there to, to give, he was a, a biologist from India coming to give a presentation in Scotland on transmission of malaria or something like that. And um, we were able to just ask questions. And he started, he started getting interest in Christianity. And uh, that is the neat thing is it's not about being smarter or showing your knowledge. It's about being interested in people. I call it a holy curiosity. This person here that I'm talking to is made in the image of God. And God loves this person as much as he loves me. Therefore, I ought to be really interested in who they are, their life, what they've experienced, what they believe, and genuinely care about them. 
And I think if we did evangelism that way, it would totally transform the perception of the world of what they think of Christians. Let's keep moving for the sake of time. Our goal then is always to lead them closer to Christ. So in every conversation, my goal is to answer questions, answer objections, so that I can get them to Jesus. My goal is always to end up asking them, what do you know about Jesus? Do you, do you know anything about what Jesus said or who he claimed to be? Because that is the crux of the matter. I, I try not to get stuck on creation. I'm a creationist unapologetically. I try to avoid that because that will derail people from talking about Jesus. I try not to talk about politics because the gospel is not about which party you belong to or what you, positions you take on issues. I want to get them to Jesus, and that's the real crux of the matter. And if they hold false views about other things, if they get saved, that's going to take care of most of it, right? I don't have to worry about that. God will take care of that. So our goal is to lead them closer to Christ. And then finally, Peter says, having a good conscience so that when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. What does it mean to have a clear conscience? It means to lead an authentic life. So your words are backed by action. I will probably mention this again this weekend, but a lot of times when I go speak places, I have parents come up to me and say, would, would you speak to my child? And sometimes that child is 12, sometimes they're 42. I'm like, my child doesn't believe anymore or they're wrestling with their faith. And I always say, I'm happy to talk to them. Let's, let's get together. Sometimes we meet during that conference or, or I'll meet up with them later somewhere. Can I tell you the sad truth? In my experience, many of the people that I talk to whose kids have wandered from the faith, when I sit down and talk to the kid, the first set of question is, I ask them is, tell me about what it was like to grow up in your home. The vast majority of kids who lead the faith do so because at home they saw hypocrisy. Their parents went to church, yet at home they cussed and swore and abused them, cheated, lied, didn't live as Christians at all. And then those people wonder, I don't understand why my kid walks away from the faith. Now, there's lots of other reasons. The influence of the world, secular philosophy, worldliness, things like that, those all play a part. But if we don't live an authentic life where Christ is the center of our life and it shapes everything we do and everything we think about, then people will rightly point us and say, you tell me Jesus can forgive me for my sins, and yet look at you. You're impossible to work with at work. You steal other people's credit. You're a terrible neighbor. And for a lot of people, that's how they discount Christianity. A clear conscience indicates a lifestyle of repentance and humility. That is, it ought to be just a regular practice for us as Christians to be under conviction by the Holy Spirit about things that are life and to be repenting. So let me ask you a question. When was the last time that through your reading in the Word, through preaching in church, through a message you heard on the radio or podcast, that you were brought to conviction about sin in your life and you said, I need to repent of this sin? If that was more than a month or two ago, you, you may not be living as, as close <laughs> to where God wants you to be. That ought to be just regular occurrences in our lives because we know that we're not what we ought to be. As Paul says, I, I'm not what I used to be and I'm not what I should be yet, but by God's grace, I am what I am and someday Christ will transform me. But folks, we ought to be just regular pattern of repentance, regular pattern in our lives of humility. Next weekend, I'll be doing a couple's retreat, and one of the biggest problems in marriages is a lack of repentance, a lack of humility, lack of love, unselfish love toward your spouse. It's kind of at the root of most things. And then finally, a clear conscience prevents unbelievers from rejecting the truth of the gospel because of Christian hypocrisy. It's one of the biggest arguments against Christianity. Well, I know a Christian, and this is what they're like. And a lot of times you have to say, I'm really sorry that that person is that way or that they claim to be a Christian, but can I redirect you to the real message of the gospel, which is Jesus? In other words, I never want to deny that Christians are hypocrites because sometimes I'm hypocritical, but I want to point them toward Christ. So in this passage, Peter lays a foundation for understanding our role 
that my job is to always be working to prepare, to give answers. So when people challenge me, raise objections, ask me questions, I can give them answers. I can plant seeds, water seeds. And then God can give the increase. Think about what faith church would be like if every member got a hold of this, became convicted about it, and in each of your spheres, work, family, class, neighborhood, friendships, you would begin to look for opportunities. And over the next few weeks and months, you would begin to speak a word for Christ, begin to engage people on the matters of the heart and spiritual things. And that became a pattern in the life that would transform this church. Because then you'd start talking about, oh, pray for my friend. I had this amazing opportunity to, to share the gospel at work, and I didn't think she was open. And I just said, what can I pray for you about? And she just, you know, gushed that her marriage is falling apart. And, and I also think what would happen someday, we get to heaven. I honestly believe this. If, if you and I are frequently sowing seed, remember Jesus, the parable of the sower? Everywhere we go, whenever there's an opportunity, it doesn't mean that Every time you leave the house, you go, I got to stop that guy in the car, witness to him. Oh, there's another car. No, but when God opens up opportunities, we'd, be, we'd get to heaven and there'd be a line of people saying, I got to talk to you because 10 years ago, you said you would pray for me. Five years ago, you tried to talk to me about the gospel and I blew you off. But it, two years later, it reminded me that, oh, someone else tried to tell me this story too. 30 years ago, you gave me a gospel tract or you invited me to church and it did nothing for all that time and then my wife died and suddenly I thought, what am I going to do? And I remembered, it was this little piece of paper and I think I still have it somewhere. Wouldn't that be amazing? And you, you might, here's the amazing thing, you might never actually be the person to lead someone to Christ where they bow their head and repent of their sin and believe in Christ. But you could be Hundreds of people deep in planting seeds and the joy you would get to share knowing you were part of their salvation. Unbelievable. So let's bow our heads and pray and then we'll take a break. We'll have session two and then I'll take questions after the second session. Oh Lord, what a joy it is to be a part of your saving work in this world. And I pray for every one of us that tonight we would begin to think about the unbelievers we know and the different spheres of our lives and that we would begin to pray earnestly and boldly begin to talk, ask questions, show interest, show love, show concern, speak the truth of the gospel when you open doors, that we would become consumed with getting the good news of the gospel out and that that would change our lives as it certainly will. We know that this can happen because your Holy Spirit is the power who dwells within us. Your Holy Spirit is the one who convicts people of sin. And your word is the living and active word of God. So encourage us, convict us, challenge us tonight that we can play a part in your great work of saving people in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's play.